Hi, this is Dan Heisman, and we're improving your chess abilities with our YouTube series. And today's video, I want to talk about diagnosing and recognizing some of your weaknesses, maybe what you can do about it. In a sense, every single one or almost every single one of the videos in my YouTube series has been about this. Sometimes I get people saying to me, but what are my weaknesses? And I say, well, you know, when we're going over the game and you did something wrong, that usually indicates a weakness. Now, they really mean something that they're doing over and over and over again. But you, you accumulate that when you look at games with good players and you, and you start to build up the things that you're doing wrong so that you see things over and over again. For instance, you can start to see, oh, I'm playing too fast or I don't recognize critical moves. Or when I get to the end game, I don't know how to analyze very well. Or I, I'm making the same opening mistakes over and over again. These are a sign of certain types of weaknesses. Now, if you're making the same opening mistake over and over again, well, obviously one of your weaknesses could be that you didn't study a lot of openings. But another weakness could be that after each game, you're not looking up your game in a database or a book and saying, gee, next time I play this position, I want to do it better. So you're creating a weakness, but your weakness has many aspects. It's the, the one weakness is that you're not playing the moves very well. Another weakness is that you have the inability or the unwillingness to look at the openings. And the third might be that after the games, you're not looking up what you did. When you're looking for your weaknesses, I think the first thing you need to do is break them into two very broad categories, one of which is knowledge and the other of which is skills, abilities, and traits. So let's give some examples of each. Suppose there's a very well-known removal of the guard pattern in tactics that most people know but that you don't. Okay, that's a knowledge issue because they've seen this pattern, they recognize it, they know it's dangerous, and yet you, when you got into a game, you didn't realize that that was a problem and you fell into it and you ended up losing material or maybe not winning material. That's a lack of knowledge. And once you recognize that pattern, you study it, you look at it from your game, and you do something about it, and you, now you say, I won't fall for that again, then you're gaining knowledge. You're gaining patterns into your brain that you recognize and say, okay, I won't fall for that again. I know what that is. What are other example types of knowledge? Well, pretty much every pattern is knowledge. Openings are knowledge. If you say, I need to what am I going to play on the sixth move of this opening? That's knowledge. If you have end games and you say, all right, how do I win uh, <clears throat> this king and pawn against king end game? Well, maybe your knowledge is that you can't, or maybe you have no knowledge and you think that maybe you can. So these are all knowledge. Principles are knowledge. So if someone says to you, if you see a good move, don't play it. Look for a better one. That's a form of knowledge. If someone says to you, you can't play what you don't see, that's a form of knowledge. If someone says, uh, in the end game, if there's pawns on both sides of the board, then a lot of times bishops are better than knights in those kind of end games. That's knowledge. So you can improve your knowledge. And a lot of people make the mistake, I see this all the time, they think chess is almost all knowledge. And they think if they go back and they study lots of openings and they study tactics and they do all those kind of things, that they can get to be a really good player just by accumulating knowledge. Well, knowledge is extremely important, obviously. We've just talked about some of the more important things in chess. But then there's all those other things that are abilities, like your analytical ability, which is probably the single most important thing in chess. Most weaker players are not that good in analysis. Now, one of the reasons they're not good in analysis is they don't have a good analytical process. But that's not the only reason they're not good. Another reason could be they don't visualize very well, or they use poor deductive logic, even if they have a good process. Or maybe they, their analytical process, they cut it short too soon. For instance, one of the things I tell people is spend time on the move chosen. If you take four minutes on a move, and the last five seconds you look at a certain move, and then you play it, and it turns out you didn't analyze it very well, and it's a bad move, well, that's both a time management issue and it's an analytical process issue. So when you're diagnosing what you did wrong, nobody would know that except you. If someone looked at your game, they can't tell, even if they look at the time stamping and see that you took four minutes on that move, they don't know that you made that move and decided on it in the last five seconds and really didn't look to see if it was safe. Only you would know that. So when you're diagnosing those kind of problems, 
you need to talk to people. You know, when I go over games with my students, I'll ask them questions like that. Like, you know, why do you think you made that mistake? Or why didn't you see this? Or why this? And once I, they tell me, oh, well, I made that move at the last second and I, I really didn't look at it very hard. Well, that's a certain type of weakness and analytical problem that they can work on and they can get better at. Uh, I put a position on the board here we can look at. Uh, it remind, was reminded of me uh, by a recent student game. So let's say you're white here and you're in a king and pawn endgame. And I'm not going to put the rest of the pieces on the board. I mean, I could set up a position like this. Let's set it up and take it away where this, the material is even. It could be something like this. You know, four pawns against four with black to move. But I really don't want to get a specific position because the problem with a specific position is <clears throat> then we have to analyze specific ideas, which is exactly what you need to do in the end game. For instance, one of your weaknesses could be you don't know how to analyze very well and therefore you hand wave your end games. If you don't know what hand waving is, you could look at an earlier video I've had on hand waving, which is a really important uh, common problem that lower rated players have. You don't want to hand wave these positions, you want to analyze them. Okay, but anyway, suppose we're in a position where these are the, the pawns on the king side. And let's say otherwise it's kind of even, like I just showed. And it's black's move and black plays g5. Well, white has three possibilities that he could do. One is he could ignore him. He could do something on the other side of the board with the king. And he could just let black have a choice of either taking the pawn or pushing past. Two is white could take the pawn and probably black will trade and we'll reach a position like this. Or three, white can push the pawn and create a position like this. And the question is, what should you do? Well, there's knowledge applied to this and there's also analytical possibilities. For instance, if you have the knowledge that you know that 99% of the time when grandmasters get the positions like this, they take the pawn then that's a good basis to start your analysis from with, gee, I probably want to take the pawn. On the other hand, suppose you haven't played over a lot of Grandmaster games. And I suggest to people, you know, you want to start by reading like Logical Chess Move by Move by Chernev. Read my book, The World's Most Instructive Amateur Game Book. I have a list on my website under more and then the recommended book lists of a whole bunch of uh, instructive anthologies. Maybe a third book would be... Um, Chess, the Art of Logical Thinking by McDonald. Uh, there's uh, Simple Attacking Plans by Fred Wilson. Uh, first Book of Morphe, and so on. Um, but anyway, if you're not reading a lot of books like that, you're not picking up a lot of knowledge. That's a tremendous way to pick up knowledge. Maybe only, second only to analyzing with good players. But anyway, let's say you have no knowledge, and you get to this position, and you realize, gee, I wonder what I should do. Well, one thing we could do is we could just simply compare two positions. Let's compare the position where you take the pawn and he takes back and he gets an isolated pass pawn with the position where you do nothing and then it's black's turn again and black simply takes the pawn. Well, in this position, black has two isolated pawns and you might say, wow, double pawns are weak. I'd rather have him have double pawns than have a single isolated pawn because then he's got double pawns. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because here, black is just one a pawn. The reason he has an extra pawn here is because he's up an extra pawn. And now black has two isolated pawns that can come down the board. So unless there's something special about your king getting into the corner with a, a special rook pawn draw, and again, that's knowledge, then it's probably better to, to let's make a white's move here. It's probably better for black to have one isolated pawn than to let him take and have two isolated pawns. Again, there's certain positions where that's not true and that's part of my knowledge. But for the great, great majority of cases, it's much better to let him have one pawn than to have two pawns, just makes sense. All right, the other possibility here for white is that he could push past. When white pushes past, he still only has one less pawn on that side of the board. But here, black has what we call a protected pass pawn. In the opening, protected pass pawns are nothing special. Um, they're nice, but there's a lot of pieces on the board. But in king and pawn endgames, protected pass pawns are monstrously strong because the king can never capture the, the front pawn, and 
the front pawn is threatening to get a queen if the king gets too far away. So here we use the, the box method here, the you create a square method of the square. And if white's king gets outside the square, then black can push the pawn in and get a queen. So white's king becomes more and more restricted the further down the board a protected pass pawn might exist. In this particular position, you might say, yes, but if the king is free to come up and take off that pawn, so you might think if you get this protected pass pawn, it's not so bad. You, maybe your king can get around it and pick off the pawn behind it, which is not guarded. Just to show you how that doesn't work, let's, let's create a, a position where the king eventually gets there. Let's put the king on f5. Now, this is something that, you know, good players would know. They won't have to figure this out. This would be knowledge for them. But if it's not, you have an analysis. And you don't want to hand wave and just say, I can get that pawn and we'll both queen. That's hand waving. You have to analyze the moves. So let's try it. Let's say white moves king to g6. As soon as the king goes past the rank where the pawn is, since it's a king and pawn endgame, there's no other pieces to stop the pawn, the pawn should start to run. And now the king can't catch it because the king and the pawn would move at exactly the same speed. This is knowledge, you know, so I know that going after that pawn is not going to work. So now I have to take the pawn and he pushes and now my knowledge also tells me that in order to get out of the way of my pawn to let it queen, I have to go into the G file. But that means when he queens the pawn, he's going to queen with check. So if I play king G7, G2, H6, G1, queen check, obviously this didn't work for white. Black got the queen first. So that tells you that when you get to this kind of position, these pawns are invulnerable. You can no longer go after those pawns and hope to, you know, have a, a reasonable end game. So that means this pawn is now going to keep your king caught in. And if we put the kings back on the board, let's, let's put the other pieces back on the board like we had before. You know, what's going to happen now is it's going to be difficult for white to hold the end game because his king is stuck being in this kind of square area here. And the black king can go anywhere he wants and try to, you know, go after these pawns. Now, we'd have to ask the computer if black's actually winning here, which he probably is. Mr. Stockfish, it's white smooth. Can white get a draw here? Stockfish says, if you look at the value here, he's he's definitely thinks black's better, but he hasn't jumped up to more than minus one here. There's, he's at minus one, minus 1.1. He's looking deeper. The number's getting a little higher. At 28 ply, he's up to 1.6. Now he jumped all the way back down to 0.4. So it's right on the verge of black being able to win this position. But it looks like maybe if white plays perfectly, he might be able to hold the draw. But anyway, that's not our point. Our point is, if you do have these kind of weaknesses based on knowledge or analysis, then you have to figure out for yourself, what is it that is causing the problem? Is it that you don't know how to analyze? Is it that you needed the knowledge? Is it a combination of both? You know, you can't just pick your weakness and say, I'm bad at the end game. Well, that's very generic. But if you had to figure out here if the king could take off this pawn before black gets the queen, all right, my knowledge is that he can't, but if you didn't know that, could you analyze it and figure that out? For instance, let's change the position. Let's move it back a rank so that now white's pawn is on the sixth rank. All right, can white get the pawn now and get out of the way and get a queen and manage to win? Well, let's take a look. So let's, let's bring the king up to uh, f6. All right, so let's try it again. King here, as soon as he goes, he takes. The pawn pushes. He goes out of the way. The pawn pushes. The pawn pushes. The pawn pushes. He queens. Black queens with check. So white's not winning. In fact, black's the one who queened with check, so it's going to be black's initiative here. So even when the pawn is as far as it could possibly be up with this kind of position, the best white could do is to hope to end up in something rather equal. He can't just win by going after that H pawn. So again, was that in my knowledge? It was on the edge of my knowledge, yes. I knew certainly when the pawn was less far up the board that he certainly couldn't do that. All right, so again, but was I able to analyze it? Sure, I could analyze it. And I didn't have to move the pieces like I just did. I could visualize that. You know, if you find that visualization is one of your weaknesses, most people get good at visualization 
by playing lots of long time control games slowly and moving the pieces around in their head where practice doesn't make you perfect, but practice makes you a lot better. These days with the internet, I have some students who think that a 10 minute game is a slow game. Well, a 10 minute game is not gonna be a game where you can visualize moving the pieces around in your head a lot because you just don't have the time on each move to look a couple moves ahead and see what's gonna happen. So you're not gonna be that good at visualization if all you play are, are speed games and you never play any slow games. Other people go to websites for visualization. They Google chess visualization exercises and they go to these websites, you know, and some of them are paid, some of them are free, and they try to work on their visualization skills. But, but the key from this video is not the visualization fixing, which we talked about in an earlier video on improving visualization skills. The key for this video is how do you check what, what your problems are? Okay, so let's go back and take a typical position. Let's, let's grab a student game. Uh, I'll grab one of my students here and I'll get a game out of his history. Let's see here. Uh, H-I-S. We'll pick on Al here, one of my old students. Okay, so let's pick a game he played. Um, I don't know. He's playing, we'll play a slow game against number 49. Let's pick uh, Examine Al Pearson 49. Okay, so when you're going over your game, if you have an engine running, then whenever the engine drops a certain amount over what you could have been, that's an indication that you have a problem. If the problem is a consistent problem or it's a problem that maybe you could have done something about, then that may indicate a weakness. So let's pick a typical number that the, that the engine could drop where you're concerned. Let's say for the average amateur, it's about half a pawn. Anytime the number goes down more than half a pawn when you make a move, that's a problem. So let's, let's so out plays E4, let's turn on Stockfish. Okay, uh, we'll make the board a little bit smaller so you can see Stockfish's main move. Okay, so E4, D6, D4, E6. So, all right, that probably takes you out of your book. The main book move there was Knight F6. And now what should White do? Well, he could put another pawn on the fourth rank. He could bring out a knight. Stockfish says Knight F3. So Stockfish says that White is up by about three quarters of a pawn already. Al bring, do, plays the best move, and of course, when you play the best move, this evaluation over here is not going to move at all. It's still around three quarters of a pawn. Black plays bishop e7. Stockfish says white should play the bishop on this nice aggressive square d3. Al plays there. Well, that's not as good because the bishop can be attacked by a pawn there on the very next move, and black could get more control of the center. So how much did it drop? Well, we said anything more than half a pawn you want to pay attention to. When Al made that move, it dropped about half a pawn. So let's say that's within our threshold of what we want to examine. And then we want to ask Stockfish, but Stockfish, why is this bad? And Stockfish says, black can play d5. d5 is what's called an AWL move, attack with something worth less. Well, when you allow your pawn to attack things with things worth less, then they have to move again. So what's going to happen is after d5, e takes d5, e takes d5, this bishop has to move again, and black has managed to equalize the space in the center. And white plays back bishop b3, and now white's, uh, white's advantage has dropped almost half a pawn from what it was before. Okay, let's go back and look at what he should have done. He should have played bishop d3 where that bishop cannot be harassed. So is this a sign of a weakness? Well, Al would know. If Al was, you know, going over this game with me, I would say to Al, Al, do you often put your pieces up where your opponent can just attack them with something worth less and then you have to move them again? If Al says, no, I would never do that. I was just sleeping here. Then that's not really a weakness except for the fact that maybe he was sleeping was the weakness. You know, he, he wasn't paying attention. But that can be the weakness in itself. But if Al says, no, I didn't know that, I didn't realize if I put my bishop where a pawn could attack it and then I'd have to move again, that that would cause me any kind of problem. Okay, then we've identified something he didn't know, a lack of knowledge, which again, we could interpret as a weakness or we could interpret as not. It's really a, a semantic thing. But the answer is he's learning something there. All right, let's go a little further in the game. And black doesn't 
attack the bishop, but he still could do it. So white's advantage is down to about half a pawn. Now he's threatening to take off this pawn. Al needs to save it. Al does. He puts the knight out. Black castles. Al castles. So the last few moves, the, the evaluation is staying about the same, which means Al couldn't have done anything much better. Now black attacks the bishop, and now the question is, should you trade the pawn first, or should you move the bishop? Does it make much of a difference? He decides to take the pawn, and we could see Stockfish thinks in this particular case, letting black gain the space there is not the best thing. It's better just to go here and let him take you in this case. Do you always know that? No. Is that a sign of a weakness? Not, ne not necessarily. But in this case, taking the pawn is inferior to just guarding the pawn. Okay, and black takes with the knight. Well, that's not as good because now he's not attacking the bishop. Is knight takes knight a threat? Not really. It brings another pawn in the middle of the board. Sure, it's doubled. D should white play bishop d2 to avoid a doubled pawn? Not usually, but here Stockfish says it's, if not, if not the best move, it's as good as anything. Now Stockfish says maybe knight takes d5. Al takes. Black has to take with the pawn. Al brings his bishop this way. But again, keeping the bishop in the middle is a little bit better with a nice eye toward the black king. Put it, keeping the bishop on this diagonal where it hits a pawn that can be easily guarded by a pawn, not so good. Is that, again, a weakness? Well, maybe. Maybe the weakness is once you put a bishop on a diagonal, you have a tendency to keep it on that diagonal even if it's no longer the best place for it. That's a kind of a beginner lack of knowledge or a beginner kind of logic. Gee, I put my bishop on that diagonal, I should keep it there. Well, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't, but you don't do it just because you, you put it there to begin with. All right, black plays b6. Strange move since he has lots of nice moves for the bishop along the h3 to, to uh, c8 diagonal, which I can't draw straight lines on. White develops his bishop. Black hits the rook, but now he's forcing the rook to go to an open file. Well, that White's certainly not unhappy about that. And look at White's lead is now growing all the way up to 1.85 pawns. So if I was black, I would be getting some good ideas here on what some of my weaknesses are. For instance, it's a weakness that if you have a great way to, to bring out a bishop that you're going to push another pawn and create weaknesses on the other side of the board just to give yourself more flexibility over there, just so that you can attack a rook that he could save anyway. Well, we call these silly threats. B6, bishop f4, bishop a6. Are you playing bishop a6 because you're hoping he won't see it and he won't move the rook? Well, that's a weakness because you're playing bad moves and hoping your opponent plays even worse ones. I don't call that hope chess. Some people do. But that's not good. You, you don't want to do that. You're just forcing the rook to go to a better square. Black plays f5. Well, now we see that he's also weakening a whole bunch of squares in the middle of the board. And White's lead here has grown to, to seven pawns. And the move he should play is rook takes e7. Why? Well, this is a tactical combination. The queen is overworked. It's trying to guard d5 and e7. If you play rook takes e7, you're winning a bishop. And if black says, oh, I can just take the rook and I'll win a rook for a bishop, you can play bishop takes d5 check. Look, oh, You're always looking for your checks, captures, and threats. And now when he gets out of check, you can just take off the rook, and you've ended up winning, getting a rook, a pawn, and a bishop, and all you invested was a rook. Now suppose you looked at this position, and you said to yourself, okay, I can play rook takes bishops, but rooks are worth five, and bishops are worth three. He'll just take me back. Why would I ever want to do that? Okay, that's the kind of thing that if you were doing a puzzle in a book, and you knew there was something there, you would get this right. But when you're playing a game, you would get it wrong because you're making what we call a quiescence error. A quiescence error is definitely a type of weakness. It's the weakness where you stop analyzing too early without looking at all the follow-up checks, captures, and threats. So if you find yourself in games missing moves like this, which most of my students do, at least when they first come to me, then you have a weakness of quiescence errors. And what you need to do is not just stop and say, why would I want to lose a rook for a bishop? That's bad. I won't do that. But simply to ask yourself a better question in your process, which is, if I give up a rook for a bishop and he gets it with the queen, I'm not going to do that unless I get something more. Do I have further checks, captures, or threats that would make me think I should investigate this further? 
And the answer is, well, of course you do. And if you miss that, in, especially in slow games where you have lots of time to look at these things, then you need to improve your thought process. Get rid of the weakness where you stop your analysis, even though there's further checks, captures, and threats that are meaningful. Now, you could say, well, that's not my weakness. My weakness is I play 10-minute games. And in 10-minute games, Dan, I don't have time to do that. I just see that the rook can take the bishop and that he would win the rook. And I just stop because I only have 10 minutes for the game. Well, in a sense, that's a form of weakness because your thought process is not very good. And when you play games, you're not learning to get better thought processes because you're playing time limits that don't allow you to learn how to think. And you say, but Magnus Carlsen plays lots of 10 minute games. And the answer is yes, but he played a billion slow games when he was a little kid to learn how to play chess right. And now he can play any speed he wants and he'll play that speed, his opponent will play that speed and they'll do the best they can. But if you're someone who's trying to improve your game, you can't just play a bunch of 10 minute games and hope that you're gonna learn how to think right because you're not gonna have the time to do it. Now, if that's all you have time to play is 10 minute games, you never have more than a 20 minute chunk. I understand adults are busy. Sometimes they just can't play slower, but that may be a weakness that you're gonna have trouble getting better at. And that's true with a lot of people. They have weaknesses and for a variety of reasons, they can't improve them that much. But my job is to try to help you figure out what your weaknesses are, put them in the right category, figure out what kind of steps you could take to minimize those weaknesses, what you could do to maximize your strengths, which are sometimes the same kind of issues. You know, what kind of books should you be reading to pick up the knowledge that you need? We can turn Stockfish off here. He has white up by eight pawns. Let's see if Al took the, the bishop. He didn't, but he saw the same combination, but he's, so he made a thought process error where he played it in the wrong move order. So he said, boy, if I get that pawn and he takes me with the queen, which he probably did, I can take the bishop and I win a pawn. What Al didn't do was he didn't say, yes, this is a slow game. If I do A, B, C, I win a pawn. But if I do it the other way and do C, B, A, I win more than a pawn. Because if he doesn't take my rook, then I win a whole bishop, not a pawn. And if he does take my rook, then I get even more. So Al actually saw the idea, but he didn't play it in the right order. One of the things that you have in your knowledge is if you see A, B, C and it looks good, and it's sort of a combination, take, 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 maybe you should do it in the opposite order, C, B, A, and see if that gets you even more. So in this case, Al had something even better than the nice move that he played, which is also a case of knowledge, which is when you see a good move, look for a better one. In this case, we have some knowledge that tells us how to look for the better one. Okay, we could go on all day like this, but hopefully I've got you started in the right track. You wanna be looking at, if your weakness is in the openings after each game, you wanna be going to a database or a book and asking myself, if we played this game again, what would I do next time? That would start to eliminate some of your opening knowledge weaknesses. You know, if you have analytical mistakes, you gotta ask yourself, why did I make that bad move? Was it because I had a, such a short time limit? Was I playing too fast? Was I playing too slow? Did I not see that bishop all the way on the side of the board? My board vision was bad. I need to improve my board vision. You got to ask yourself, why did you make those mistakes? Not just, oh I, oh, I made that mistake. I won't make that again. Why did you make them? What steps can you do so that in the future, your chances of making similar mistakes start to go down and down and down? You're never going to be perfect. You know, Magnus Carlsen still loses to Stockfish, <laughs> but you can get better. You can find what you're doing wrong. If you're doing the same things wrong over and over and over again, <clears throat> that's the sign of a weakness and you can improve on that weakness. Okay, sounds good. So if you enjoyed the video, please hit the uh, like button. You can subscribe to the channel, but more than that, please tell your friends about my channel, Dan Heisman Chess. The more the merrier. If you tell the other people, I really appreciate it. See you next time. Bye.